Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm Will. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons, from lazy lava monsters to loving lamias. And today we're talking about Lolf. So yeah, Brian, today we're talking about the evil spider queen known as Lolf. The biggest strider. The biggest the biggest of the driders. <laughs> the, big, the biggest fucking drider. Big Dude. mama drider. She's not statted out anywhere, is she? Not in 5e, she's not. Yeah. Not yet. Not to my knowledge. In 4e, you can kill everything. In 4e, you can kill everything. And she's actually like the on the title, on the like the, the front uh cover of Monster Manual 3 and 4th edition. So like in okay, so the the famous saying, if if it has stats, you can kill it, right? Right. So is Wizards of the Coast saying that you can't kill Lolf because they don't have her statted out? They try to avoid uh, statting out any like deities, especially deities of like intermediate or higher level. Like w- like Asmo doesn't have a stat block. Like Asmo doesn't have a stat block. Right. And quite frankly, any greater deity like like Asmo or even or Bahamut you know, doesn't have a stat block, right? Not yet. But since Tima has one, you would probably put him in roughly the same like okay. category of power. Like he's like he's spiked on a couple of different stats and yeah. like she's a lesser deity, so she's oh. like on the on the edge there of being able to be defeated. Yeah, but really, when you defeat her, you're not really defeating her. You're just defeating her physical avatar. And, like, if you were to go to her outer plane, she'd be much more powerful. Okay, you know, sure. Fight her on her terms. Right. But let's talk about Loth. So okay. Loth is the major goddess of the drow. Uh, as I said before, she's also known as the Spider Queen, also Queen of the Demon Web, Lady of Chaos, the Dark Mother, Mistress of Lies. A lot of really dark, nasty names. Because uh, she's kind of devourer a dark, nasty of chaos. Person. Devourer of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> um, she uh, she's been anything from a lesser deity to a greater deity. I think most commonly she's what's called an intermediate deity. <laughs> okay, she's somewhere in between. She's the she's <laughs> the level of DDR that I play. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> just a regular uh, guy. Just 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 trying just trying to step trying to step everyday normal guy. Yeah. Okay. So she lives in the abyss on the sixty sixth layer known as the demon web pits. Oh fuck. Um. She is chaotic evil. She um. She's both a goddess and a demon lord. Remember, if you conquer a layer of the abyss, you get demon lord powers. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Like Demon Gorgon. Like Demon Gorgon. Shout out to Demon Gorgon. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> uh, she's usually blamed as the sole instigator and cause of the division between the Drow and Elves. Right. We're going to talk a lot about that today. We've talked a lot about that, but have we really? But have we really? No, we no, haven't. Not we're, until today. We're, we're going to get into it. At last. Indeed. The story will be complete. She's known to have three forms. Uh, one in, as like a beautiful matriarch Drow. One as her Drider form. Uh, and one as an enormous demonic spider. And this is said to be her actual true form. She's oh. like the thing from it. Like, oh, she's actually Pennywise. Big, yeah, like Pennywise, big the spider form. Spider. Yeah, except for way more powerful. Pennywise is actually a vampire. Is he? Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. In the Stephen King like universe. Okay. There's different kinds of vampires. Gotcha. Is he like a psychic vampire? Yeah, he feeds off fear. Gotcha. Okay. So her most notable attributes are her cunning, treachery, and deception. It's kind of what she's known for. Uh, not only is she literally a spider goddess, but she's known to spin her elaborate schemes like a great web, connecting and taking into account like <laughs> a great many people, organizations, beings, and other variables. Yeah, totally. Very scheming. Yeah, yeah, I got you, like Xanathar. So she... What? Yeah, like, Xanathar, like a like beholder. Kind of yeah. like a beholder, yeah. Mm-hmm. Without the, like, the, the psychopathy of like... Yeah, less know, psycho. Schizophrenic craziness more streamlined uh, mentality although i will say she's psycho i think she's a crazy psychopath crazy crazy spider lady she has a philosophy that only the strongest and most cunning deserve to live Ooh. okay isn't beauty interwoven into that a little bit um beauty the the beauty part is just being an elf and that's part of just the normal standard shit it is (laughs) that's just so the bars on the ground if we're talking about beauty this philosophy comes from um when she was cast into the abyss by Coralon. Uh um where she landed, there were these like demonic spiders that were would like basically devour each other. And the last spider standing was like the biggest, most powerful, and it gained power from devouring all the other spiders. Okay. And she was she thought this was the way the world should be. And she basically wants her drow, her her followers to be like like these spiders. So a quick quick spider story. Okay. Um okay. just general. Have you heard 
I don't know if it's an urban legend or if it's this is for real, but I've mm-hmm. heard of like people buy like a you know people buy like a oh this mansion is so cheap why is it so cheap mm-hmm. I was like oh there's ghosts but in this case there's like spiders that are breeding rampantly mm-hmm. and they move in and a couple weeks go by and they start seeing some like spiders and they were seeing like these big brown recluse spiders right real and they dangerous were, you know killing them they're like okay we like a week goes by and they're like we have a problem we kill these spiders left and right we have more and more they're showing up in my bedroom right. time to call an exterminator yeah, and the exterminator absolutely. comes and this, all the spiders go away and then all of a sudden the spiders are back and it's the same kind of like scaling going on okay. where like now they're in my room I call the exterminator back they call the exterminator a few times they can't get rid of these spiders and eventually they have to move out because there's so many and they're like breeding all over the place wow. and they're eating each other and it's just like that's how they're feeding they're getting fed sounds like the demon web pit is incurring on that on that location there's an abyss <laughs> portal in the basement yeah, or indeed. whatever yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, you've never heard of stuff like that? I haven't, but that's... that's I gnarly. think it's an urban legend, but I I don't know. That sounds like the movie Arachnophobia. <laughs> maybe it's a, maybe <laughs> Which it's a plot a of a movie. Which is a pretty cool movie, yeah. And maybe it's somebody like was these, just like, Brian's never seen this. Sh- you yeah, never seen Arachnophobia? Let me tell you a story. We are so fo- so far <laughs> off topic, but in Arachnophobia, like, there's these crazy fucking spiders that like kind of move into a neighborhood. They get, like, they're get they from Africa or some fucking far off location. And yeah, they start breeding like crazy, and the exterminators can't really get rid of them, and they're terrorizing the town. Yeah, maybe it's that. Uh, and are we off topic? Because this is just some spider stuff you can throw some into the, your lore. Spider lore. Spider lore. Okay. Well, yes. So, <laughs> Welcome so to Lolf, the Spider-Verse. So Lolf sees these, these demon spiders, and she's like, that is the path to perfection. <laughs> like this. Mm, yes. Indeed. Uh, yeah. And this is what she bases her entire teachings on when it comes to the drow. And because of this, she revels in putting her worshippers through devastating trials and tribulations to weed out the weak. She actively teaches them to betray, lie, and outmaneuver each other. This keeps the, t- the drow tightly in hand as they vie to please her. That's crazy. It's kind of like playing checkers with yourself. You're like moving all basically. your pieces against each other. Now, this has worked out in her favor multiple times in like the Forgotten Realms world when she actually makes moves to like conquer places. Yeah, because you got the cream of the crop all the time. True. But it also, it puts her back more so than anything because like they can never get their shit together. Yeah, they're, they're always like, fucking vying th- for my, power against each right. other. Right. My theory here is that like the the abyss itself, remember, it corrupts. And I feel like the abyss has kind of corrupted Lil to the point where she is kind of her own worst enemy. Yeah, man. Like, she, that's D&D for you. It's like the bad guy's going to beat itself. Indeed, right. So. It's so powerful that if it wanted to, it could like mobilize and take over the the world and shit. But, it'll but never it can't happen. because yeah. it just doesn't. Yeah. So she has very <laughs> few allies and a whole lot of enemies, but she has a special enmity towards Corallon, also Grumpsh, and uh, any deity that tries to claim the Underdark for itself. Uh, she's like, oh, hell no. Oh, so, hell no. Yeah, so. This is my dark. Uh, her ultimate goals are essentially the Holocaust of all non-drow, but first and foremost, High Elves, Wood Elves, and Eladrin must be conquered or killed. Right. Period, end of story. She wants to conquer the world and slay Coralon and take over the elves completely and then have the elves conquer everything. Okay. So, yeah. so first, the elves, then the rest of the world. Yeah, then the world, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cool. So her dogma is do whatever it takes to gain and hold power. Rely on stealth and slander in preference to our confrontation. And whatever you do, seek the death of elves and Eladrin at every opportunity. There you go. And that's that's it. Yeah. See an elf, kill an elf. Indeed. It's like see something, say something. So, story time. It's Will's story corner. It's time to tell you one of the two Lolf stories I'm going to tell you today. Because Lolf and Corallon and all their lore has been basically one cohesive thing all the way up to 5th edition. Sure. And with the release of Morning Kindness to of Foes, they've made some major changes. Um, but we're going to talk about as well. But first, let's talk about like the classic... This is what Lolf has always been up until recently. So, yeah. Totally. Okay, Lolf, let's do it. Lolf was originally a Roshni, the wife of Corlon Lorethian. Uh, and God, she was also the goddess of destiny and artisans. Um, she was noted to be the, like the most beautiful of all the elven goddesses as well. Okay. She's really, she's painted as a Jezebel kind of character in this story. Oh and my. You, you'll see. Okay. So she she dwelled with Corlon and all the other gods in Arvander and with the elves and whatnot too. Um, she's basically queen god of the elves in a way, but specifically she had dominion over the drow at the time. And they weren't even called drow then. They were just called elves. I don't know if they had an actual name. There's just a... They, get, they get called drow after their betrayal, but we'll get to that. It's just so. the elves that were standing over here by me. <laughs> right. Those are my bros. So um, the 
Orishne and Coraline even had children. Um, Veron, who's a bastard, and, and Illustrae, who's really awesome. And that's their daughter, their son, and their daughter, respectively. Uh, she had a very close connection to the Drow and was their patron deity. At some point, despite her great standing and power and beauty and all this other stuff, she grows discontent and even jealous of her husband because her husband kind of runs everything. He's, okay, he's the Lord of all elves, basically. Mm. Um, and in her ambition, she seeks out to have Coralon killed and assume complete control of the Seldarine, which is... Stage a coup. Stage a coup, yeah, indeed. Win the game. Yeah, yeah. she wants to gain control of the Seldarine, which is the Elven Pantheon and Elven Kind. Now, she does this in more than a few failed attempts, and the most famous of which is when she allies herself with Grumsh and try, puts Grumsh in a position to kill Coralon, but he fails, and uh, basically the position she puts him in is she... She gets Grumsh to, to go after Coralon, and she curses Coralon's sword scabbard to cause uh, the blade drawn from it to shatter at contact okay. in combat. Wow. So Coralon gets into the fight. His sword shatters. He still ends up winning. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He just uses the butt of the sword hilt to, like, he knock just, everyone unconscious. In a Grumsh. <laughs> so, um, it's just a brass knuckle is, now. This is why orcs hate elves, because their, their <laughs> god just keeps getting in embarrassing situations. So... It's said that basically every attempt on Coralon's life is thwarted by another goddess. Her name is Sahanin Moonbow, who suspects all the foul play of Arishne is doing, but she doesn't have proof of it. Okay. She manages to basically, in the nick of time, basically save Coralon's skin. She's got a bad feeling times. about this. Yeah. yeah, she's just always looking out. Yeah, she's always looking out. Yeah. And, okay. and, and I like Sahanin Moonbow. She's one of my favorite deities. But she's she'll get talked about a little bit here, but she'll get her own episode. He's like making breakfast in his kitchen, and she's like in the corner with the bow drawn all the time. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> she's just taking bullets. He's for him not. Too. She doesn't only have to watch out for him, but has to like hide from him so he doesn't find out she's yeah, doing exactly. it. Exactly. So he never like, knows. What are you doing, Sanin? You're so paranoid. He like she like fires the bow. She's like, "What are you doing in my kitchen?" He's like, "Don't don't worry about it. Don't ask any I, questions. I handled it." So eventually these betrayals culminate into a final climactic event uh, of treachery. She organizes an army of anti seldarian forces. Forces? Not forests. <laughs> She's she a fuck ton of tree ants. She, yeah. So many. <laughs> she organizes an army of anti seldarian forces to invade Arvandor. Now, she does this in a, in a kind of a cunning way where she sets it up so that they're strong enough to invade but not organized enough to actually win. She okay. just wants them to cause damage, and then in the chaos, she's going to get Coralon. So killed. this is just a like a really elaborate ruse and an elaborate ruse indeed, that which is total, totally totally lull. Yeah, and it's just how she rolls. So um, so yeah, she organizes the army. Uh, they invade Arvandor. She traps the Hanin Moonbow to stop her from interfering this time. <laughs> Great with, uh, but she couldn't do it by herself. She actually her son Veron or Veron uh, helps her. Okay. Um, she also orchestrates two key events to trigger during the conflict to get Coraline killed. Number one, uh, the she she um, she comes up with a way to immobilize Coraline with the help of an ooze named Ganadar. We're not talking about Ganadar. Is it too relevant much. ooze? Yeah, he's like an ooze deity who is also a drow deity and. Gonadar confuses me, and I don't know enough about him to really talk about him in great detail. I bet that everybody has their own ooze deity. Like, if you are a deity, you get your own kind of ooze that's under you. Sure, but he is kind of in love with Lolf, and mm. she she thinks he's fucking gross. He's a fucking ooze. He's an ooze deity. Everybody thinks ooze is yeah. gross. But Gonadar uses his elder eye to immobilize Coraline via direction from Lolf. <laughs> okay. Number two, though, she secretly curses the arrows of her daughter, El Elastrae, who we've established is a very nice mm -hmm. and awesome Super goddess. Super cool. Um, so that when Elastrae fires upon Gonador to stop him, the arrows instead magically fly into the chest of her father, Coralon. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the plot thickens. <laughs> <laughs> so the forces of Coralon manage to fight off the invaders, but Coralon lies wounded from the arrows of his own daughter. Um, in a final master stroke, basically, you know, just everything, throwing everything in the wind, this is the final thing. Uh, Arishni is going to attempt, or she attempts to poison Coralon by passing off um, this liquid as a healing elixir from, like, some other plane of existence. She okay, drink totally. this, it'll heal you. So, uh, so yeah, he does drink it, and he gets poisoned, and he's dying now. Oh, no. It's at this point that Sahinin breaks free, and her, along with two other elven goddesses, fuse together into a mega goddess called the Triune Goddess, and kicks the shit out of Arishni. <laughs> 
What the Kicks hell? Kicks the shit out of her and then cures Coralon with, with their combined power. They put on their fucking fusion earrings and shit. Yeah, like, basically. This is the only way we can win. Yeah, exactly. And one of them really doesn't want to do it. Yeah, but they do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, they do it Coralon's anyway. about to die. Damn, I imagine uh, Illustrali like, fires an arrow and she's really super dope because she's an elf, right? So mm-hmm. it immediately like changes trajectory and she sees it going into Coralon's, like, towards Coralon's chest and she tries to like fire another arrow to stop that arrow. <laughs> right. And it also just goes into his chest. Yeah, yeah I can <laughs> see that i can see that happening she's like oh what the fuck yeah. <laughs> so they so they kick lolf's ass she's totally. not even lolf yet she's still a Rishni. um when Coralon when Coralon awakes a Rishni is put on trial and she's found guilty obviously uh as punishment Coralon turns her into a monstrous spider and <laughs> seems like a bad idea some lore says that he actually changes her nature into a tanari which is a demon that doesn't make sense to me because it's like how would Coralon have the ability to change her nature to something he has nothing to do with. That, okay. So okay, for me, sure. I, I, it makes more sense to me, like, he turns her into the form of an ugly spider. Um, because the thing, uh, the idea here is that Coraline still loves her. Cause, like, oh. So he can't bring himself to kill her. So instead he banishes her. Which is, gonna make worst, you... which is the worst thing he could do because it breaks bad for everyone, really. Yeah, I mean, he, I'm just going to make you ugly and send you off. But he, yeah, he, he turns her ugly so that she can't seduce anyone anymore, even though she can change her form. But yeah. like, I guess if she's talking to another god, like they're going to see her for who she is. Right. She's an ugly demon spider. Like, you got a nasty spider booty. Yeah, but Gonador's <laughs> still about that, so... Oh, wow, like, there you go. <laughs> yeah, There's so... somebody out there for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, um, yeah, so he banishes her to the abyss. We preach love on the dungeon cast. <laughs> indeed, we preach love. Um, so, so okay, so there's kind of two stories of drow betrayal here. In some lore, this is where the drow betray um, Coralon and the other elves by siding with Lolth in this Arvander invasion and all that other stuff. In Forgotten Realms, there's this thing called, there's a series of wars called, called the Crown Wars where... There's a bunch of different Elven Kingdoms, and in like a very Games of Thrones esque style of story, um, they all start vying for power, sure, and and like having rights to thrones. And in the end, the Drow they play a game in their kingdom of thrones, right? And the Drow in their kingdom slowly but surely are getting seduced by Loth and turning to evil until the whole nation is basically a gone full Nazi, and <laughs> and then okay. they get conquered or they get. You fought never, back by the other elves and banished into the Underdark. You never so go full Nazi. You never go full Nazi. So, Aloth is actually not the only one banished here. Apparently, there's other... Conspirators? Uh, conspirators that okay. also get banished. Like, there, there's a Dark Soldarine, uh, which they're the Dark Pantheon of, of Drow. Sure. So anyways, Elastrae <laughs> actually exiles herself along with Loth for two reasons. She's kind of punishing herself for her own naivety of letting Loth kind of use her okay. in that thing. But more importantly, she feels like if the Drow are being banished and Lolf's being banished, like they're screwed because she's just going to corrupt them. So that's them. why she goes so I'm to, going and I'm going right. to save whatever few ones I can. Right. So gotcha. yeah. So with the telling of that tale, Brian, let's take a short rest. Let's do it. Hey everybody, welcome to the part of the episode where we're not talking about the last thing at all. We're talking about how much we love and how much we love you. Well, it's the same. Lots I get love yeah. on today's episode. Love for you listening to this. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, we had a contest and now we don't because it's over and somebody won. Two people won. We don't know who yet though. Not now, but when this drops, we do. True. In the future we know. So we do know in we the do. future. So next episode, we should be announcing the winners, I <laughs> yeah, think. Yeah, <laughs> on the episode. I mean, go check our Twitter. It's definitely going to be announced there. And we're definitely going to get some shipping details for some people to ship them their new prize. Indeed. Ziz. Mm-hmm. Well, one prize per person. There's two people, two, yeah, two prizes. Yeah, two people, two prizes. Indeed. Yeah, iTunes, SoundCloud, <laughs> YouTube. You know where to find us. Yeah, find us on those spots and um, tell people about this show. Please, if you think there's somebody out there that would benefit from this or just would like to listen to some D&D podcasts, two guys shitting the shoot. Shooting the shit. Wait, what? Mm-hmm. Let's go back to the show. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Welcome back, everybody. Indeed. Mm. Mm. What do we got? What do we got next? That was a good. That was a good story. Okay. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. 
Because now we have another story. It's another story. <laughs> it's a different corner of the room, but it's still Will's story corner. Indeed. Um, <laughs> so basically, in Morton Kind of Stomaphos, they they really delve into uh, Elven lore and like yeah. explaining like the history of elves and where they come from and Coralon and all of the all this other stuff. And in doing so, they change a lot of stuff. So I'm not sure what's really canon and what's not. Um, so I'm going to tell you basically kind of where Lolf stands, sure, uh, according to Mornikinens. And in order to do this, I kind of have to tell a little bit of the Coralon story, which I was originally going to say for the Coralon episode, but it's kind of unavoidable, so we're just going to get into it. Okay. Um, in this story, rather than being presented as like a Jezebel character, Lolf is presented as almost a Luciferian character. Okay, sure. But let's get into it. This is kind of like the Bible. Kind of. Where and there's, there like, are things about this story where, okay, so like the story we just, I told before the short rest, it, it had a real like almost like Greek gods story to it. Yeah, of, Like sure. the pettiness and mm-hmm. the, the real jealousy hu- and the jealousy, the betrayal. Like, well, and that's kind of like the deal with Greek gods is like the human nature reflected in these super powered beings. Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be more, uh, a lot less relatable, but let's get into it. So in the beginning, uh, of creation before there was almost anything there were the greater gods and Corlon was one of them before the bard song Bef- no uh, after the bard song oh after the bard song yeah, but I, before I the know, rest of it uh, maybe i don't know anyways <laughs> he was a greater god of mutability and grace uh with no one true form and this is kind of the one of the major changes they make here is that they're really leaning into the chaotic end of the chaotic good deity Corlon Lorathi okay and basically he could take the form he was always something good and beautiful and, but he could change form at will. Sometimes he was a babbling brook, and other times he's a elegant stag. And you know, it, it, he was just anything and everything at all times. I always picture him as a stag. Like, um, who's the guy in in Lord of the Rings? They show him in the Hobbit a lot. The Hobbit movies, um, the leader of the elves or whatever. The oh, wood elves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's wearing like the white robe, and he's got like the antlers on. Mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. Just picture like. More antlers. Oh, you're talking about that dude. He was. That's not all around. That's uh, I can't remember his name, but he's the leader of the elves from Mirkwood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, that guy. So like yeah. more robe for Coralon. Yeah. Just that. Yeah, but that dude more. has a real Coralon look to him. M- yeah, for sure. More robe, more stag horn, maybe with like <laughs> right. like Christmas ornaments, yeah. like adorned from the stag horns. Uh, at this time, like the idea of elves looking like elves is like it, no, it just doesn't exist. So he, he probably would never take that humanoid form that you're picturing yet. Not yet. But we'll get to it. Okay. Okay. So. Um, the original elves were actually born of the blood of Corallon when Corallon being the whimsical, um, chaotic good deity they're painting him to be in this new edition kind of irritates Grumsh. They get into a fight and, but Grumsh, they, they damage each other and when Grumsh damages Corallon, he bleeds and from his blood is born, uh, the original elves called the primal elves. And the primal elves were basically like an echo or a reflection of Coralon. Sure. They were also mutable and had no true form and were very powerful because they're basically the part of a god. They're right. the splinter of a deity, if you will. Yeah, they're just god seeds hitting the ground. Yeah. Some of growing these, real fast. Some of these new elves, once they were noticed by Coralon, became favored because and elevated above the others because of like their ideas and natures. Basically, they were better than the other elves. So, <laughs> so he made them even better than Super they were. Duper elves. He basically he turns them into the first elven gods. Okay. Um, one of these is Loth. Oh. And there is no Rishni. They're not doing any wife thing or any of that. She's just she's basically just some Loth over there. She's just Loth. And Loth, and she's kind of painted as like the the greatest, most beautiful. Blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, she's not content in her servitude to Coralon or in the seemingly frivolity of the elves and what they're doing because they're just having a good time. Yeah. Being elves. Just dancing around some fi- bonfires. Right. She Smoking sees the devil's lettuce. The other gods and the other. <laughs> she sees the other <laughs> gods and the other races doing things and organizing stuff and exerting their will upon the world and like getting shit done. Sure. And she's jealous of that, too. Mm. So she thinks that, and she has the idea that the elves in all of their natural power, because they're basically spinners of God and they're naturally powerful, as we talked about in the UNT episode, they're kind of super people. Yeah. Um, She thinks if they could become more grounded and organized and could settle on, like, one cohesive idea, goal, and form, that they could become the dominant force of the cosmos. Get shit done. Now, granted, she's probably not wrong. She's probably quite right, but we'll get into how this all goes wrong. Yeah, because you're trying to change the very nature of what's going on. Right. And her idea is, in the exchange of their own individuality and their own personal freedom, 
uh, they can gain unity and power. Mm. So she she ends up seducing the other gods to come around her idea. And her and the other gods are the first of all the primal elves to choose a form. And the form they choose is what you would think of when you think of an elf. At least like, at least like a prototype elf. Right. Like basically just a perfect elf <laughs> without all the weird variations like Shatterkai and Eladrin and all that. Stuff. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, like a con- like a concentration base form base form elf. Yeah. Yes. Okay. First gen. So, and after that, it, like the other primal elves start to do this. Almost all of them will take this form, and they become this this unified race of beings that look like one thing. Okay. By doing this, the elves come to see reality differently too. They become a little bit less godlike and a little bit more mortal like because of it, and um, they now see Corlon as like their father god, and Lolth is their mother god for bringing about this change. Ah, okay. So. Corlon is utterly revolted by this and sees it as a huge act of betrayal because he, <laughs> he is, walks in one day. He's like, oh, what the fuck? Yeah. He's like, what the guys shit, do? guys? Like, <laughs> why is everything all stagnant? <laughs> this is the worst. This is not what I had in mind. Yeah. This is supposed to be a fancy party. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so he's really upset. And OK, so the way they word what happens next is unclear to me. Either Corlon attacks Loth physically or... Verbally, <laughs> I'm not sure. A boot kick to the face. Yeah. One of them might be. It might either gets, be a metaphor or an actual boot. He gets real freaking mad and Just drop kicks and it right turns there into in front of everybody. It turns into either a civil war or a really strong debate. I'm not sure based <laughs> off the language. Shit goes down. Shit goes down, and everyone's upset. Are they throwing punches, or are they just t- like, is that? Are they just talking really angry. Yeah. At each other? <laughs> okay. Um. At least at first, I, I, we know for for sure by the end of this, it does turn into a physical conflict because of Lolf. But, um, basically, a huge amount of the elves are siding with Corlon because they're like, okay, maybe we fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Corlon's really bad, and he makes some really good points. And the other people are like, well, we want to be able to choose whatever path we want, and Corlin's being a dick. And he kind of is being a dick here. Oh, man. But Loth being, becomes, as this is going on, and it, because they're elves, like, who knows how long this took? It probably was fucking decades. Um, it, she becomes more aggressive, violent, and murderous as she's solidifying who and what she is. Um, and in this, she attempts to assassinate Corlin while he's deep in thought considering the whole conundrum. Okay. Right. So at least he's thinking about it, even if he started off as a dick. Either way, she tries to sneak up behind him and fucking kill him. Yeah, sure. Um, and she, he ends up, like, throwing her... Well, okay, so his host of elves that were on his side protect him, and there's a battle or whatever. And at the end, Corlon throws Loth into the abyss. He expels all the elves except for the gods out of Arvander, and that's that. What if he just threw her so hard, like, she went to the abyss, and it wasn't, like, necessarily intentional? Or did he like go, like drag her by her feet to the abyss and throw her in or whatever? I like that image because that's like, that's woo, that's crazy. Yeah. But, um, like you beat her into submission and now you got to like take her, I don't know. I think the way I actually picture it is, um, see, here's my problem is I, I'm a really big fan of Coralon pre this lore because I, I like the image of Coralon and, this Corallon that they've kind of painted is much more fae like and much more like whimsical and carefree. And that's not the Corallon that I'm used to. I'm used to like Corallon's not necessarily stoic, but he's he has a certain amount of, um, I guess, prestige about him. Like, no, like kind of that. that he's refined um, and he's elegant and he's like a sword master and he like a master commands spelled. respect. He commands respect and like he's like this ancient and wise being and he encourages you to be individually free and to express yourself and to learn and to become wise like him. Okay, you know what I mean. He's he's a god of art and magic and swordplay and and the beautiful things of life. But he, I've never seen him as this like immutable fey. Like this is kind of whimsy. after we've done our episode on Eladrin and like all the elf stuff we've done. This seems more in line with like yeah, this it, is the, what they're going. Uh, for. This is where they're 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 taking elves, which yeah. is fine. It also, I mean, it's a good way to really divorce D and D elves from Tolkien. We're moving real far True. away from Tolkien you now, which really, is fine. Really lean into the Fey. People like the Fey. I can see why this is a good move for for D and D. Right and. This is just coming from somebody that is not married to the idea of like the fourth edition lore or anything like that. This or, is all or br- anything before. Yeah, that. or anything. This is brand new. This seems it's, this seems in line and it makes sense. 
Right. It's it's definitely well done. That being um, said, as we always say, this is your It's your world. Your Do world. what you want. Yeah. Like I, this doesn't work for my homebrew but, and really the only thing it really comes down to is I like old Corallon better than new Corallon. Mm-hmm. And this story only works with new Corallon. So uh, yeah. I'm just sticking with old old Corallon. Yeah, that, story. that's fair. Yeah, so. I mean, I I like this just as a, like if I don't have I don't have any lore going on like this is cool with me. I don't yeah. I don't mind. Like the other one sounds good too. I just they're both yeah, they're both good stories. It's just they completely play contradict. Five, they yeah. completely contradict each other. So you're gonna have to choose one. Yeah, if I'm gonna play five e as five e, I mean this yeah, is what we got. Exactly, that's probably what I'll go with. Okay, so let's get back to Loth and who she is. Yeah. So she revels in the struggle and upheaval of her own followers. Uh, we kind of talked about that with the trial and tribulation bit, but basically, like. She revels in it so much that she's literally the biggest sower of chaos amongst the drow herself. Right. Uh, my, we actually talk about it a lot in the drow episode, but from the perspective of the drow people. Right. We, the subjects we do. of this torment. Um, and I'm not sure if we talked about this in the drow episode, but my biggest example of her being the biggest sower of chaos amongst the drow is the character Driz Doerden. Oh, who yeah. Is. You don't know much about him, but I mean, you know, he's a superhero. He's a superhero, basically. Uh, yeah. But basically, he's the biggest thorn in the side of Drow society. A superhero. Like, let me let me clarify when I say that he's mm-hmm. a, he's a demigod, basically. He, yes, he's written like a demigod. Well, he also kind of is, and we're gonna get to that. So, like, he's a great shame to the Drow people for being like good and right. and righteous, which is like completely counter to their life philosophy. And even more so for his success at fucking them up. Yeah, he's, he's an him. abomination. Yeah, to them. This, yeah, exactly. He's an abomination to them. And what makes it worse is he freaking messes them up and shames them basically constantly, even though they're doing what in their eyes what they're supposed to be doing. So right. His very existence and success brings up like crises of faith amongst the drow. Yeah. And, like, like ideas of revolution. Yeah, if he's and, born of us, then it, what else? Exactly. And this sows chaos amongst drow society. He's basically a, just an elf. But do you know, like, one of the major sources of his power is that, okay, so in Forgotten Realms, you can be what's called a chosen of a deity. And when you are a chosen of a deity, you basically become a demigod. Right, okay. Well, guess who's chosen of? He's chosen of Loth. This guy. Yeah. Oh, shit. Well, because he causes so much chaos and disorder that she's like, fuck yeah. Like, I simultaneously <laughs> hate you, but I'm going to But you did it you. so good. Yeah, but you're just so good at what you do. <laughs> I'm going to make it so you do it even better so that, like, her idea, I think, in the long run is that, like, he'll cause so much chaos that only the strongest will rise from her people. And it'll be him. I think she's crazy, personally. Well, yeah. maybe because, like, everybody has is predisposed to hate drow. Mm-hmm. Probably mm-hmm. in the rate right, like Forgotten Realms lore mm-hmm. that him going to the because he goes to the surface yeah. and starts fucking mucking around. That's mm-hmm. probably got to cause a ton of a ton of chaos with people's mentalities and shit. Like, yeah. hey, look at Drow, let's kill it. Yeah, and but, he's like, no, I'm a good boy. Right, but I mean, at this point, he's an established hero, oh, and I don't even I mean, know if he's still chosen Loth. I just know that was a major thing, and I like to use it as an example. Okay, yeah, I don't know anything about like the actual. I know there's a lot of Dritz fans Dritz, out there. Drizzed, Drizzed will get his own episode for sure. We'll get there one day. All right, so let's move on, though. So Loth's clergy is run exclusively and tyrannically by female priestesses. Loth is a misandrist by nature, probably because she hates Coraline so much, Mm. and and she dictates that her drow should be as well. Okay. Um, She lives in the abyss in a place called the Demon Web Pits. Right. Um, It's an abyssal layer made up of, well, it's it's like this giant, it's like this giant web hive floating in this foggy darkness it is if you like took an x-ray of it it would look like a tree but it's just a bunch of fucking yeah that's like, a good cave e- webs because exactly i picture spiders just fucking it up in trees just like webs all over the place yeah sure basically it's an abyssal layer made up of pathways of sticky web that form 20 foot wide tube like holes and that they overlap and they expand in infinite directions. It's like a web high. Oh, I was I was spitballing, but that I was not far off. Yeah, when, when I you said, said tree, I was like, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, so fractals uh, beyond do it too. beyond the web tunnels, uh, the layer is filled with this putrid with putrid gray clouds. They're actually poisonous. They'll fucking kill you for breathing it. Um, also, much like the underdark, teleportation is blocked here. Now it's blocked here by Lolf, but yeah. So there's no easy getting around unless you are a spider. So yeah. Nice. So the denizens of the Demon Web Pit are mostly... Or a uh, ranger. Or a ranger who specializes in that bullshit. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, 
So the people who live here are mostly she's mostly made up of like the more powerful drow worshippers who've died. Um, so yeah, worshippers of notable power, various demons. Because don't forget that this is the abyss. So there are demons that live here. Yeah, it's, they all serve Loth. Loth rules here. Um, specifically, there's a very special kind of demon um, called the Yoklo. So <laughs> the Baba Yaga, <laughs> the Baba Yaga. No. <laughs> so they're, the Yoklos are known as like the handmaidens of Loth. Um, and in That's their creepy. in their base form, they appear as these yellow tentacled oozes with oh. a single eye, and they oh, emit a really ooze. foul smell. Now they have the ability to transform into a few different things, either into a seductive drow woman, a giant, a giant spider, or a suffocating gas that will choke you. In, in what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay. now Yoklos are. I, I can't remember their exact like level of power because you know demons kind of have a power hierarchy, yeah. but they're like high mid range. Okay, sure. Um, they're specific to like this Loth. realm, <laughs> huh? Like Loth. Like Loth. Yeah, they're specific to this layer. Um, so they're only You're uh, not going to find them in okay, other. So there's two okay, areas there's, of the abyss. There's two Yoklol um, origin lore bits. One is they're born here. Sure, and they're only born here. And the, by the way, they are. Uh, devoted fanatically to Loth. Oh, okay. Like, they're chaotic evil, but not when it comes to Loth. They they will live and die for her. They're chaotic evil until Loth tells them to do something and then become lawful. Right, I suppose so. You could say that. And um, the other origin is they're imported from no. the beaches of Australia. No, the other origin is that they're imported succubi that Loth performs a ritual on mm. and turns them into a Yoklo. Oh. Either way. Well, regardless, they're born there. Regardless, they're born there yeah. and only there. Right. And they serve only Loth. And... On this plane of existence, they are top dogs, period, end of story. Even, like, top-level fiends like a Balor, which is, like, as high a level as you can get without being a demon lord, they are underneath the Yolklos as so long as they're on this plane of existence. Gotcha. This is Lolf's um, hierarchy. It's what right. She's decided. So, um, because... Every layer is its own special snowflake. Indeed. I've been finding. Indeed. Like Jumanji. So, like Jumanji. So uh, they have the ability to transform, like I said, and because of this, they're employed as spy masters. Um, they're also like the general taskmasters and like agents of Loth. Like they're just they're they're the generals and the and the specialized units. They're like uh, f- they're like minions from Despicable Me. They're like do- they all look kind of similar. They're doing <laughs> they're doing like every they're task all, though. I mean, they're all yellow and they have one eye, but like the <laughs> minions from Despicable Me. Like one of them's checking you in when you walk in the yeah, door sure. and all it's that. Just this There's monster. another one wearing like a like a like a Mater D's outfit that's like taking you inside. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Any questions about Lolf? I'm not sure what else there is to talk about. Like, she's got. Okay, so she's the leader of the Dark Seldarine, but mm-hmm. like that doesn't mean anything since they all hate her and are working <laughs> against her actively. Except for two. There's like two. I mean, she doesn't seem to give a shit who is into her or not. Oh no, she don't fucking care. Yeah, she don't care. Um, her her biggest rivals besides like Corallon, obviously, is her own son Veron. He's he's chaotic evil too. Yeah, we haven't heard about him in a while. Yeah, I mean, he helped her out at first, but after the banishment, like he he's basically now working he mostly just sits on her. the couch and no, no, he's got his own uh, <laughs> thing going on. As a matter of fact, he's probably the second most followed of all the drought deities. Oh wow, okay. she considers him the greatest threat and greatest rival. Um, as we said, Ganadar, he's he's gone through some some shit. Like he he's gone from like deity with like a his own agenda to like a mindless ooze and i think he's come back as like a, a deity i remember he robbed all <laughs> he robbed all his followers of like intelligence and turned them into mindless oozes basically this is your, the kid that went to community college and doesn't know what to major in yeah basically that's gonna dar <laughs> for you and there's a few other deities that, so you have like, arrested development but not really and then the kid that went to community college <laughs> right um there's elastrai who is basically super confused She's not confused at all. She knows exactly what she's about. Oh. She's just any time uh, there's drow that are susceptible to the path of good, she just works really hard to get them to come on over. <laughs> uh, I think that it's taught like drow raiding parties to service are taught not to raid during full moons because Elastrae is a goddess related to the moon, not a goddess of the moon, but she's related to the moon and. Um, a few other things, but basically, she's more powerful in the moonlight, and she's more likely to try and seduce you to good. Okay, in the moonlight, I don't know. It's weird <laughs> shit, man. I, you know, Low I wanted floor. to say something about like the Fire Nation is hacking the Water Nation. Oh no, no, I don't think there's a parallel here. I mean, they're so, the Waterbenders are more powerful, powerful in the full moon. Are they? Is that yeah, the absolutely. Oh, because the gravitation of the moon and the ocean. Is yeah, kind of like the the two yeah, Waterbending gods are the are 
push and pull of the tides and the, like, oh. the, the moon and the ocean. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done talking about Loth unless you got any questions about her. Like, I mean, that's what she's about. That's what she do- does. That's her origin story. That's where she lives. It's so confusing. Like, this is what beholders are about. Just like, they're all about this, but they can never fucking do it. Right. Like, because they're them. Except for sometimes they do, but then the heroes win. Yeah, and then they're <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Which is less, that's like every story ever told. No questions. So. All right, <laughs> we're gonna call it a game. Thank you guys for listening. Bye. Talk to you guys later. The Dungeon Cast.